everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's Diana. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob, it's Jackie McDonald on the <laughs> podcast. Jackie, have you ever listened to the, the podcast, The Flophouse? Nope. There's a character, and his bit for a very long time is when they do letters, he would sing a song about the letters they were going to get, and he'd write like a new song Ooh. every time. Yeah. An improv. It was an improv song, yes. Oh, maybe yeah. I will not listen to it because I don't have time in my life. I have too many podcasts <laughs> on waiting. I have a list that I go through. The podcasts are about this topic of waiting? No. Or you're pod- waiting to listen to them? The topics are The Girls Next Level. What's that? It's a podcast about the girls that used to live in the Playboy Mansion back in... Oh. oh you told me about that. On Bravo. That's my number one gotcha. favorite Gotcha. Right okay. Now, which is hilarious. I know no one listens. But if someone does actually listen to that one also, email me because I don't know anyone. And then I just tell people that don't watch it uh, or don't listen to it about what happens on it and it's really weird. I'm like, you know what happened this week on Girls Next Level? Like, we don't care. And I'm like, but here's what happened. And then I talk about it. What is, I, is it a show rewatch or it's like a retrospective? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. It's a, they're rewatching the show and talking about the episodes. Okay. And this is an interest of mine that I've been perseverating about. Mm-hmm. And so even if you don't want to listen to it, I usually tell you what happened. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Hugh Hefner was like a creepy perv and... You know, it's debatable. Yes, oh. in some instances, no, in some instances, but mostly yes. Okay. Yeah. But uh, uh, I would say 99% of the time, yes. Okay. Huh. All right. But the playgirl, like the the playboy bunnies and like the girlfriends and how the show pitted them against each other. So you guys are actually interested in this interest that I'm interested in right now. Look at you looking at me and... <laughs> I mean, I keep checking the sound levels and, 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 you know, and looking away. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to signal, whether we want to continue this conversation or not. We should probably get going on our main topic. We should be on topic, which is talking about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research, because that's what we do on this show. We talk about a given topic related to our field and relevant research articles and then discuss what that means for practitioners. Though, again, it's okay to go off topic sometimes. That's why people listen to podcasts rather than just sit, read an article, think about it and stare into space for 10 minutes and then say, great, now I know that and move on. Most people (laughs) seem to enjoy a little bit more interactivity in, in their reading at times, at times. So... Speaking of going off topic or focusing on topics that may or may not be of interest in people around us, today's episode is going to be about perseveration. The, I guess, you know, original kind of one of the key components that made up, say, what would be, you know, back in the day, an Asperger diagnosis terminology, perseveration. This was, I believe, was a listener request or someone had emailed about talking about perseveration. Yeah, it was. And she's specifically wanted us to identify if there was any research related to perseveration around a person, mm. right? Like oh, wanting like to hair. like, mm. I think it was like wanting to interact with one person or talking about that one person a lot. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't find it. In my article, they do have that one of, so yes. So, so spoiler alert at the <laughs> end of my article, they talk about what, what they did in that instance. Mm. Yeah. And one of mine is referencing like historical people, but I think that it's, there's not a lot of research in this area at all. No, so I was we're going to just surprised. try to cover things more generally, and hopefully that will help people to sort of see this from a bigger picture perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because one of the things we noticed when we started putting articles into the folder that we thought would be relevant, that didn't just copy each other, was there were like maybe five or six articles that very specifically targeted changing pers- what you know what would be defined as perseverative behavior. And we'll talk about definitions, whether that's an apt definition in a little bit. There just were not that many of them to the point that we even put an article in to end with. It's our capper that really isn't about perseveration at all per se, but about finding preferred topics of others, identifying interests of others, because we really didn't want to end on the bummer of some of the questions that really raised, that were raised for all of us in terms of just discussing perseveration and whether or not it is an appropriate treatment target so let's 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 do it let's talk about this helping each other (laughs) because to be honest we all have perseverative topics right let's just put that out in the open yep yeah yeah right now my currently is girls next level (laughs) right (laughs) you just be bringing it up no one asked for it up recently what you did bring that up recently (laughs) 
We all, you know, it changes. That's something else. You know, it can change from time to time. So, like, your preferences are idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And they they do change. And so that's something that we need to be thoughtful about. Oh, yeah. I think we're going to go over that in our definition, too. But I'll add to that. I don't know that I verbally or vocally state my perceptive interest that much. But I have a lot of perceptive thoughts. That you keep to yourself. Good. Yeah. Do you love that you and I are like, is good. that true? So, and both of us are like, how do you know? Is that true? Does she perseverate about things? Everyone I, does. I would assume so. Right. Yeah, Everyone but I don't always say it out loud. So that's another thing to But is it about. good? I said good, like, good, like, oh, interesting. But you know what? I, I don't want anyone to think it's like, good. You <laughs> should keep those to yourself. <laughs> Nobody cares. But it is one of those one of those areas where many of us might have topics that we love talking about. And we have been shaped by our environment to never talk about them because that that you know verbal repertoire has been punished by others in the past by looks of disgust or statements of that's a terrible topic that everybody hates or why are you worried about that that's dumb you're dumb you know nobody likes yeah. that or i'm like so, oh no one else wants to hear this yeah exactly right so that i actually I sort of always like want to hear it self perhaps you, you overgeneralize that response <laughs> that suppression right. well, response, that's an response. Issue i have yeah but anyway just thought i'd throw that out there too well let's get into the topic does not have that issue <laughs> but no, i love talking about things <laughs> <laughs> Folks, this, this, this is my first podcast. <laughs> Let's talk about perseveration by talking about the articles on perseveration. Oh, okay. That we will be discussing oh, you today. Want me to stay on topic. Could you stay on topic? Okay. I'm sorry. Diana just suppressed all verbal behavior at this point. But wait, don't you guys want to just talk about girls next time? <laughs> it was a really good episode last last week. I am interested, but you can tell me more later. Okay, great. Okay. So we selected five articles that we will at least tangentially touch on in this episode. We're going to talk about all of them. We're Okay, I'm so sorry. We're going to talk about all of them in depth. And well, I don't mind in depth. We're just going to talk about all of them it's directly. It's almost the entire canon of research. These are my favorite episodes where we're just on. like, let's do a topic. Let's look at the research. There's not that much research. And then it's like, we did it, everybody. We did all the I know. research. Rob loves to complete sets. We never have to talk about perception. I was like, do we need to talk about published. all five? And he said, but then we'll have completed the set. So that's all. why. But some of them are going to be short and sweet. Some of them cover some very similar themes. So the articles are in chronological order. Functional analysis and treatment of verbal perseverations displayed by an adult with autism. By Rayfelt and Chambers, that was published in Java, 2003. Functional Assessment and Treatment of Perseverative Speech About Restricted Topics in an Adolescent with Asperger Syndrome by Fisher, Rodriguez, and Owen, that was Java, 2013. Functional Analysis and Intervention of Perseverative Speech in Students with High-Functioning Autism and Related Neurodevelopmental Disabilities by Kuntz, Santos, and Kennedy, and that was published in Java, 2020. Functional Analysis and Non-Contingent Reinforcement with Extinction in the Treatment of Perseverative Speech by Megan Gandanu Hoar and Valdez Michael, published in Behavior Analysis in Practice 2021. And finally, The Beginning of a Friendship, Teaching Individuals with Autism to Identify Shared Interests by Hood, Gopez, Fallon, Bazinski, Aquino, and Monroy. That was in Java 2022. So I'm curious whether writing articles about perseveration and perseveration treatment, whether there's some sort of superstitious behavior that you must begin that article name with <laughs> a functional analysis of. Because I get it in I get it in the you know, kind of the original Ray Felton Chambers. You know, it's the first of you know looking specifically at this topic in Java. Functional analyses are still kind of hip and cool in 2003, but then it just keeps going. It's like, come on, folks, it let's come up with a new title. Yeah, because there are a lot of ways you can you know, word that title that don't start that way. The yeah. effects of blah, 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 right. blah, on blah, 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 blah. They, no one went for that. Well, just, I, I don't know whether there's so few of them that everyone's like, well, what's common about this research? Well, somebody did a functional analysis. I mean, can you imagine if every article started a functional analysis of blank and related treatment? It's it would be awful. We'd all be like, why are you doing this? Of course oh, you did a functional yeah. analysis of some kind. I kind of like it. I'm just going to buck the wheel here. That's not the thing you say. You would buck a trend. Buck a trend here. And I like it because then at least I don't have to waste my time knowing did they conduct a functional analysis or not. <laughs> so if I see that they did, I'm like, okay, great, good. Let's move along. So every every article should also start with an effective or an ineffective treatment for. So you're like, I'm going to read this garbage. Yes. It's ineffective. Yes. 
throw this one in the recycle bin no, immediately. No, I would want to read the ineffective treatments as well, though, so that I would mm-hmm. know where the limits of the treatment are, mm-hmm. right? All research matters, Rob. I like it to be a twist, though. You know, at the end, like, I assume this is an effective treatment because it's published in, an, in a journal, and then it's not, or it's moderately effective. Like, what? Blows my mind. Mm-hmm. Anywho, let's start by defining perseveration. It's called the file drawer effect. Defi- I, you know I, I, I've also read many articles. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start by defining perseveration. So what is perseveration exactly? And I think this is a term that gets used a lot. I think, sadly, it is... Well, I don't know about sadly, but it it definitely, to me, when I hear perseveration, I take it to be somewhat of a pejorative term, sort of referring to the idea that an individual has a topic or, you know, from the listener request, topic of interest or an individual they would like to engage with, and they really try to engage in multiple responses to continue to come back to that topic over and over. It's possibly a topic of a very limited scope for other individuals, but high, you know, a, a d- deep, but not, not wide in breadth in terms of topics of conversation are usually considered perseveration. The original Asperger paper describing what, you know, used to be referred to as Asperger's and now is, you know, more kind of subsumed into high functioning autism. Would, which is also not a great term. Which is also not a great term, but it yeah. is it is a so term, and it's in some of these terms. Yep. Yep. Described children with, quote, intense and highly focused interest on specific topics about which they could recite a remarkable amount of information. So, again, it's this idea that some individuals, again, usually autistic individuals, when we're talking about perseveration, will focus only on a few topics. Those tend to be topics that remain relatively stable throughout, you know, a a longer period of their life than you might expect. You know, developmentally, children find interest in topics, talk about it nonstop for a little while, then change to another topic. That may not be the case, or it may take a more delayed change, you know, a longer time period before changing that topic. It sometimes can be difficult to redirect the individual to talk about something different than those topics. And many of their conversations sort of focus around those interests. And again, sometimes those interests can be super specific, such as in some of our examples, talking about talking about things like fire alarms, sirens, going to the dentist, specific TV shows, specific movies, specific characters, specific toys, construction equipment. So they might be sort of Interests that are outlying from what you might expect. Exactly. Right? And maybe a smaller or very small percentage of people are like game to talk in depth about Mm -hmm. that. Doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that interest. And anyone who has young children may Mm -hmm. (laughs) reflect on their own current experiences and say, wow, my kids only want to talk about Minecraft, Pokemon, Octonauts, Kitties, Blues, Bluey. Mm-hmm. Right? I do love Bluey, though. You wanted to say Blue's Clues, Tyler. I did. And, and you were going to out yourself as an old. So there's two blue dogs, and they're both girls. Yeah. Just noting that as well. What? Oh, yeah, Blue from Blue's Bluey Clues. Bluey is also a girl. Yeah. Yes, Blue is I a mean, girl. I mean, Blue's Blue from Blue's Clues is also He's a girl. A girl. Mm-hmm. I just love as it. As is Magenta. Mm-hmm. Remember when Magenta got glasses? Yeah, I love it when Magenta yeah. got glasses. Yeah, that was good. So you, everyone may be like, oh, kids like to talk about their own special interests, and they don't always pick up on the social cues when I say I'm done talking about that topic, they just want to keep talking, right? Because it's the thing that interests them the most. Yeah. But if it's something like Pokemon, there's lots and lots and lots of kids who want to talk about Pokemon together. Mm. Yeah. And that makes it sort of more of a socially, we all see it as like, this is a socially okay type yeah. of thing, right? The only difference, if you love fire alarms, is that you may not have other people to talk about fire alarms with and because it's, it's outlying mm-hmm. the we then see it as oh this is different and therefore unacceptable but it's really not any different than how much you love pokemon it's just such a unique interest that it's hard to find a partner well the other the other challenge that you might find with perseveration and i think this is going to be true for every individual who's ever had a conversation about something of interest to them is kind of redirecting or continuing to return to that conversation you know i'm i've always been a big comics fan back when it was not cool to be a comics fan and it's very never easy never no never stop me i mean you'd always find a couple people who wanted to talk about comic books and then you know you go through periods where you're not as interested in it but nowadays almost everyone's gone to see a marvel movie or wants to talk about a marvel movie a little bit and i don't except for jaggy <laughs> so i don't talk about this with jaggy 
But, you know, there have been plenty of times when I've had conversations with people and we started talking about Marvel movies and I misread their interest in Marvel <laughs> comics as a whole and started talking about things that aren't related to the movies, they're mm. related to the comics or related to the creators. And this they'll kind of keep... Us too. Yeah, they'll kind of keep coming back yeah. to, you know, yeah, but that Wakanda forever. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, one of the things that was interesting about the original, you know, jungle action run of Black Panther, and, and I kind of keep going back to the part of the conversation that I want to talk right. about. So even though it might be, you know, tangible tangentially related, it's not the conversation that my partner wants to have. Sure. What's well, uh, the Watchman interpretation, movie adaptation? Watch, too true. Watch, watch Men? Watch Men. Too true to the comic and therefore not a good watching experience. Oh, you just stole that opinion from me, I believe. <laughs> I do listen. <laughs> she does listen. I go, I don't know. I'm right. like, no. now I'm just like, I can't. That's what yeah. I'd say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so all of our social interactions, as far as discussions of our unique and varied interests, are shaped socially by our conversational partners. Yeah. If you have a social disability, it's harder to tell if the other person you're talking to is really into the thing that you want to talk about the most. And so if you're missing some of those social cues, then your behavior may be less shaped by that conversational partner than yeah. if you are more in tune to those social cues. So at the end of the day, perseveration in itself, as long as it's not, you know, as kind of our listener wrote in, potentially uncomfortable for another person, it it's not necessarily a, tr a behavior in need of a treatment. It is, you know, and the treatment may be, as we'll talk about and spend, you know, a good chunk at the end of the show talking about, it may be more an issue of just ensuring that a few sort of like good social rules of thumb are learned or taught or generalized to environments. But the, the issue is not you should never talk about your preferred topics. The issue is more sometimes it's good and may be beneficial to understand when and when not people are interested in talking about your preferred topics. And if you're not finding people who are interested in your preferred topics, are you able to find a friend group that may want to share those preferred topics with you so that you can talk freely? Enter the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Again, if your audience is interested in, you know, old 1960s Marvel comics, then great. It doesn't matter that the average human being might be like, you're a perseverative and no one wants to talk to you. If I've got an audience that wants to hear those topics... I've got a friend group potentially, yeah. and I've got a group that would not define that behavior as perseverative so much as fascinating. Absolutely. So really what we're going to be looking at these articles under the lens of is the idea that we're not thinking of perseveration as a problem behavior. What may be a problem is that certainly, you know, looking at some of the citations in, say, like the Hood et al. study is that lots of surveys of individuals with ASD – at various ages, you know, report that they have a low percentage of individuals in their lives that they would consider friends or that are outside of their close family circle. This can lead to trouble with long-term employment and can lead to, you know, mental health crises such as, you know, depression when you don't have individuals that you can share interests with, you don't have individuals you can interact with, especially as, you know, autistic adults get older and their parents age and are not able to really interact with them as much or pass away, can really limit their social circle and their ability to continue developing as social circle. So that's really the lens we want to look at this topic in. Not so much that it is a problem, but that it could be related to some of the other social challenges that autistic individuals, well, really any individual who engages in too much perseverative speech might find themselves in. And if they are uh, interested in finding friends, which most people are to some extent, then all right, do they have the necessary skills to understand how to find people who would like to share those interests, not to, necessarily stop having the interests. Right, and I think... Spoiler alert, my, my study goes into not only how to find friends, but how to keep them, mm -hmm. right? Because you can find, you can be, you can go to an organized activity, but that doesn't mean necessarily that when you're at that organized activity that you're going to then find your bestie that you're going to be able to be friends with forever, yeah. right? So like once you identify that someone could be your friend, then how do you keep it going, right? So first impressions are not always mm -hmm. like the mainstay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So of the four articles directly targeting perseverative speech or perseverative topics, I would think really only one of them would have risen to us kind of in, in a retrospective review of them to say that might have become problematic because only one of them was a situation where perseverative speech was often a precursor or if you didn't engage in perseverative speech the right way could lead to actually physically challenging behavior from a ch from one of the from the child whereas in the other articles it's more a matter of boy this individual sure only talks about a few things and it's weird and let's do a treatment. Mm -hmm. I think that our uh, as a field, our understanding of this topic has changed dramatically mm -hmm. since the first 
issue that we're or the first article that we're going to talk about exactly. as well. So I think that that's to give everyone some perspective. No, Diana, people who did things old and not the way we're doing them right now were totally wrong. Just like right now in the present, what we're saying is probably never going to change. Know, I know. No one's just... ever going to look back and say, what were they talking about? What a crazy statement. You're right. There's a context to everything and one must look at that with grace. I understand. Even though I like black and white thinking and I'd like everything to be either right or wrong at all times. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's start with Ray Felton Chambers. So 2003. So this was kind of not not necessarily the first article or first research article looking at perseverative speech, but sort of the first one that is looking at it in the way that we're discussing today in terms of like perseverative speech seems to be a problem. Let's develop a treatment using a functional analysis as featured in the title, a new and improved functional analysis methodology. Not even, you know, well, it only been 10 years or so since the reprint of the What It All article in 2003. Yep. Everyone had chunky highlights. Mm hmm. I didn't. <laughs> Except for Jack. I was never cool. So. <laughs> so previous research looking at similar topographies of verbal behavior in the 70s and 80s looked at things like individuals using the same response when asked certain questions or in looking at bizarre vocalizations, quote unquote bizarre vocalizations in schizophrenic patients. Those aren't exactly the same thing as what we're talking about, which are the treatment of Vince, a 23-year-old autistic man, also uh, with intellectual impairment, who worked at a workshop and was, you know, very social accordingly, but would often continue to talk about the same topics over and over, like sirens or alarms, going to the dentist or doctor's appointments or talking about coughing. So again, not necessarily topics that everyone is very interested in talking about outside of very narrow context of, hey, I just went to the dentist. Oh, how was your dentist appointment? That's all the dentist conversation I need to have. Mm -hmm. In a year, probably. So, uh, again, nothing that was probably harmful to Vince, but may have led others to sort of avoid Vince. Like, oh, Vince is coming. I don't want to talk about sirens today, so I won't have a conversation with him. So it it could lead to cutting off some of his social interactions. So the authors did a functional analysis. We've heard of these before. With 10-minute sessions and a reversal design. So pretty simple stuff. And their FA really just included some of the basics. You know, we had our intent. We had an attention condition in which Vince would either get reprimanded or have the tester or the therapist make reciprocal statements to whatever he was talking about, whatever the topic was, because it didn't seem, you know, it wasn't clear which one was more often occurring. They both Mm -hmm. kind of happened to him when people either didn't want to talk to him or they kind of go along with the conversation. So they use both forms of attention. They had a typical demand condition where he do, you know, vocational tasks he do throughout his day and get a break from it if perseveration occurred. They had a tangible condition where he'd get to do preferred things like write about the topics he enjoyed. So writing about sirens or writing about fire drills. And then a control, just like normal. So nothing nothing too fancy here. And they basically use their attention condition as baseline because, surprise, surprise, the perseveration was the highest in the attention condition. So hmm. from that, they said, well, let's use a good old DRA procedure for quote-unquote appropriate verbal responses. And then we'll put perseveration on extinction. So if Vince started to engage in conversations about any of those three topics, then the therapist would sort of remove attention and eye contact for five seconds. So sort of look away, which is the much less polite way to signal to someone, I don't want to talk about this topic is just, I will turn away from you and not look at you and would give you know attention for the verbal responses that were not related to the three topics. So again, they used appropriate in the, in the research paper. I don't think we would use the term appropriate. We would just use different topics or uh, off of those target topics, right? And again, with the with the DRA and extinction in place, there was an increase in appropriate vocalizations, and then they were able to make you know the the switch back to higher rates of perseverative conversations when they did their reversal. They never did anything with generality, so kind of a small little study, it was like three pages long, to determine whether or not this then would lead to less talk on those topics in the work environment and. That was that. And that was pretty much it for perseveration research in Java for the next 10 years, which brings us 10 years into the future to Fisher et al., who pretty much just did almost the same study uh, (laughs) with (laughs) some additions. It was was an extension of Rayfelt and Chambers. But that's nice, though. I like the the repeat, right? Because we're using single subject design. It's always good to make sure that we can see replication across different participants. Early studies only had one or two participants right. each. So it's anyway, important. It's important. Very important. I, and I know that we're like, oh, just, I mean, but man, 
Way to rock it. That's what I say. If you can replicate someone's thesis, uh, research, I'm saying thesis because that's what I'm always thinking about. Mm-hmm. Replicate someone's research and then extend it slightly. We're still expanding the boundaries of where we might go with that tr- specific treatment. So I want to talk to everyone in those intervening 10 years and be like, really? It took us 10 years to come up with this extension? <laughs> well, maybe what happened is that, <laughs> right? They started it like two years after and then eight years later, it's in now finally published. Hmm. Right? Like, certainly could be. That's certainly true. could have happened that way. Or no one was interested in researching the topic, or everyone just sort of decided, like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't that big a deal. Maybe it doesn't need as much research. Yeah, who knows? I, I know. That's how I said. I, I want to know. know. I don't know what I was doing in 2013. Something. 2013? Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm just kicking it. That's what I was yeah. doing. Feels like a very long time ago. It does. It wasn't that long ago. No. It was only 10 years ago. Wow. Oh, feels like a long yeah. time ago. Feels like a long time wearing ago. Wearing skinny jeans. I was still which wearing. I'm still wearing. I'm still wearing. Skinny I'm not going to do the mom jeans. If you're actually a mom, you really can't wear mom jeans, which no. makes it annoying. Yeah, really. Truth. You, Rob doesn't know. No, they're hard to sit down. And or don't care. But regarding this, before you move to Fisher, just regarding the vents. I mean, I know the Ray felt side, but with, with vents, I just want to know. Like, I feel like his topics are all like about potentially bad things that could happen to him, right? So he's like, what if there's a fire and there's a fire drill? What if I'm coughing and I'm sick? What if I have to go to the doctor and something bad happens to me, right? So I know like it's hard to determine with just a classic FA if it, if you're talking about you're talking about some type of social reinforcer, right? The behavior's maintained socially in some capacity. But you don't necessarily know if it's just due to attention in like this sort of crude form or if perhaps talking with someone alleviated some type of anxiety for him. Right. So it's actually working in a negative reinforcement capacity. We don't really have those details, but I wonder, given like his particular interests that he wanted to talk about, if there was a piece of that going on. It's possible. He may have also liked to talk about sirens and alarms and the doctor because he enjoyed those activities or he was just interested yeah. in them. Yep. So it's, yeah, th- this, this is not a long study and they did not get into that level of detail, but it certainly is, you know, potentially of some real value to sort of have a better sense of, you know, the why of certain conversation topics. So we get the to. The wind is weathering. Yeah, it's fair. I, was, I thought someone was scraping something on the ceiling above it. So we get to Fisher et al. And they're like, let's extend Ray Felton Chambers. Let's add a multiple schedule to that differential reinforcement treatment that they used. Because what we want to determine is, does that more effectively increase the conversation on, quote unquote, appropriate topics for our uh, for our participants? So this is Derek. He was 14. He had a diagnosis of, at the time, would be Asperger and some other neurological conditions they mention. He had no other stereotypic behaviors, intact verbal behavior, followed instructions. And really here they were looking at sort of the duration of perseverative speech, but also looking at off-topic speech. Derek really enjoyed talking about specific comic book characters or violent topics was the other uh, thing he enjoyed. They defined anything on the top, on anything that was violent or referred to comic book characters as perseverative and anything else was not perseverative. However, they also made the distinction that just because one is not talking about the target perseverative topics does not mean that they are on the topic. So talking about the topic that the you know, speaker is bringing up. They may be, you know, the listener may then refer to things unrelated, yeah. like the weather when you're talking about, you know, the economics or something like that. So usually there'd be some keywords that mark the start of preservative speech, like Batman and the Joker and the Batcave and the Batmobile. He's a big Batman fan. So the goal was both to see if they could uh, get uh, Derek to have spend less time talking about uh, those perseverative topics and increase talking about on-topic conversation. So, list you know, as the listener, ref, you know, responding to a different topic that the speaker brought up. So, what the therapist wanted to talk about, and as I put in parentheses, who chose these topics? You know, mm-hmm. they also chose the most boring topics to talk about. I, I thought Batman was way That's cooler. Sledding, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> So, again, you know, when they're looking at data for Derek, he could also be on topic and perseverative. So the example they gave was, what if what if sledding? What if sledding was a topic? Oh, Derek, I love sledding. And then Derek started saying, you know, Batman likes to go sledding. I think that's really – I think that's fair. I think there's a subtle distinction, though, because I think that does start getting into – while one can certainly talk about Batman and sledding, right. it does start getting into that – 
very kind of subtle conversational tactic of I'm trying to get this conversation to go the way I, as the listener, would like it to go back to. Mm -hmm. So back to my example where we're talking about, you know, oh, Wakanda forever. Oh, you know, Angela Bass is up for an Oscar. Did you know that Black Panther was originally created? And it's like, yeah, you're on topic, Rob, but you're not really sharing the conversation yeah. in the way that we think of, you know, sort of a shared conversation. You're, you're trying to talk about something related, just related enough to get it back to where you want it to be. So, so th- here that where can you've be noted difficult. the Batman issue number and year, is that your edition? Uh, well, I, then, I, then I suddenly wondered, I wonder if Batman ever has gone oh. sledding. And I looked up Batman sledding and I did find, yes, Batman number 26 in 1944. Batman did take Robin <laughs> and Alfred on a trip on the bat sled. That's actually fantastic. You know, I, I had to find, I dropped it, like Skinner says, I dropped everything and had to look that up. That was very important to me. Wow. You will see it. It's it's, it's going to be our podcast art for oh, the episode. Yes. So you'll all get to see Batman sledding. <laughs> this makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. I take this job very seriously, folks. You do. Mm-hmm. Good. All right. So they did an, a quote unquote efficient FA. They, they, they didn't even write that in the title, an efficient FA yeah. with perseveration, where they just did attention and ignore conditions in a kind of a reversal design based on the report of the caregiver. So they do these kind of quick five minute sessions where they'd either give attention on any talking at all or whether they just sort of you know leave leave Derek to sort of hang out by himself and they didn't pay any attention no matter what he was talking about. And then they started running their treatment because, again, in this case, perseveration was maintained by attention, by the therapist's attention. And the real big difference here was we've got our differential reinforcement of non-perseverative speech and differential reinforcement of on-topic speech. And they just set up kind of rules to show up, show what their multiple schedule was. So, okay, there's a green card. We're going to talk about whatever you like. And then when it's red, I'm going to tell you what I want to talk about. And that's what I want to talk about. And they did let him know if you do talk about Batman when the card's red or something, something, you know, I don't want to talk about, then I will ignore you for a little bit. So they were upfront about it with Derek. And if he talks about something appropriate for 30 seconds, then the card goes back to green and we can talk about what you want to talk about. So kind of a pretty, pretty basic intervention. And they, you know, found that they, you know, increased the amount of time that Derek would talk about non-perseverative topics. And then they flip the card back to green and they'd sort of, you know, increase that time. And they'd give him attention if he was on topic or just, you know, talked about anything that wasn't perseverative. And then they'd stop the timer and look away briefly if he started talking about Batman and the Joker and all that. And what they found was that Derek was able to decrease the non-perseverative speech during that red condition and then would engage in perseverative speech during the green condition. But he wasn't necessarily on topic. So he would just make related statements or other mm-hmm. statements that weren't perseverative, but not necessarily in response to what the therapist said, which good Some job, Derek. Control. You really found a way to right. get out of like, I'm not talking about whatever boring garbage you want, therapist. I just need <laughs> yeah. to say anything at all and I'll get back to Batman sledding. So they added a second condition in which the differential reinforcement was only for on-topic behavior. And then, yes, they did see that perseverative speech, you know, maintained, you know, was maintained at low rates during those kind of red card conditions. And there was an increase in the actual on-topic speech, not just non-perseverative speech that Derek was making. They changed the card to a band on the wrist, and then they were able to extend this to treatment to be used by, you know, other individuals in their clinic, as well as to Derek's family members. And they were able to show that, you know, this behavior was maintained with those schedules in place at 28-week follow-up. So it was effective in terms of decreasing what, you know, when Derek talked about other people's interests, or I'm sorry, decreasing when Derek talked about his own interests, but also allowed Derek to continue to have periods of time where he did get to talk about his interests. It's a little forced in terms of this is not usually how conversations occur and without the visual would that have continued or was Derek learning a new skill you know was it a new cusp behavior or was it just behavior totally controlled by some sort of a man and arbitrary rules not sure yeah yeah I do like the signaled aspect here Mm -hmm. right because it's a multiple schedule (laughs) yeah that's that's totally why I love a multiple schedule (laughs) No, because there are all of us have to learn to respond to those cues, right? Mm-hmm. There are times when you can talk about your favorite thing, and then there are times that you can't because you need to be talking about something else. So like right now, we're all talking about perseverative speech. And Jackie wanted to talk about the Hugh Hefner podcast, but we can't right now because we have to record <laughs> this episode. I do instead. still want to talk about it. Though. I know you do, and that's okay, but you're responding to the cues available yep. to you, right? So we've all had to learn how to do that. And I think that that is a useful tool. Mm-hmm. All right, let's continue on. We're moving 
almost, not quite 10 years later, almost 10 years into the future to discuss Kurt's <laughs> and <laughs> Kurt Santos and Kennedy's. They also did a functional analysis, Diana, but what else Great. did they do? I was do? still wearing my skinny jeans in 2020 mm-hmm. as Same. well, but now I was wearing a mask yeah. to go with. <laughs> Way to bring down the room. And Diana still had <laughs> chunky highlights. I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so I don't think an, a lot needs to be stated about this article because it falls in line pretty closely with the two preceding articles. In this one, we had two participants, only one of which had an ASD diagnosis. The other one had an OCD diagnosis. We had a Paul and Charlotte, and they each had their own definitions of perseverative speech. Charlotte seemed like they included all the things that she liked to talk about, basically. So her mom, pajamas, church, movies as well as things that she said when she wanted people to watch her do cartwheels and handstands. Mm. But I guess she did them a lot, and maybe there were... I can see why there's a time and place to do a cartwheel and handstand and, and not. And the time is now! Watch me, everybody! <laughs> and Paul liked... It was the one I mentioned before who liked to talk about historical and literary figures, not part of the current conversation, which I also respect, because there's a lot of interesting people, fictional and non-fictional, out there in the world, and he wanted everybody to know about them. So they, they went ahead and did a classic five condition functional analysis here including a tangible condition i thought that was an odd addition i wasn't sure if it was simply because it was like a nod to you know the the original rayfield article but it seems like when you add a tangible condition for behavior that there's no reason to think is maintained by access to tangible you are creating Mm-hmm. A yep. reinforcement condition. Yep. So that is the danger. And, and they were very clear, but like, yep, and it was definitely tangible as well, which I don't know. Right, right. So for Charlotte, initially it was quite variable in the FA. Then attention kind of emerged as the winner there. And then for Paul, attention was always high, alone was variable. But then as they continued the FA, tangible started to increase. Yeah. Because it always does. Yeah, you can shape up that contingency. So that wasn't a surprise, but I wouldn't have considered it to be a primary function of the behavior. And I mean, then, un- unless the report was like, oh, my, every time he talks about Shakespeare and Aljous Huxley, we just give him M&Ms Aldous to make Huxley. him stop. Right. I mean, behavior is malleable, right? So there's no reason to think that might not happen. And then the intervention was a withdrawal design in which they compared baseline condition, which was just like the attention condition of the FA, a differential reinforcement with extinction condition, but that happened for both participants. And then for one, they added a differential reinforcement with extinction plus prompting condition. And they also measured what they categorized as appropriate speech during this time as well. So Paul only received the base comparison of baseline and the DRA plus extinction because it was quite effective mm-hmm. for him. So it's just like the studies Rob described as far as the way in which that was structured. And then if he wasn't engaging in perseverative speech, then they, he received attention and they talked about other things. Even though there was a differential decrease between baseline and the intervention condition, they still saw a fair amount of perseverative speech, around like 50% of intervals, even within the intervention condition. So it was a win, but it was by no means like reducing it completely. And then for Charlotte, they they did that comparison. They did not see a super dramatic change with, with just that condition alone. So then they added in a prompting condition where every one minute they gave sort of an invitation to talk about other things. So like presented new topics, yep. right? Like, oh, I have a dog. You want to talk about my dog? as an idea (laughs) of something else to talk about. And for her, that was very effective. They saw her rates of perseverative speech reduced to almost zero levels with that condition. So that that study really followed in the footsteps of those two preceding studies as far as the form of the intervention and the idea behind why someone might engage in perseverative speech and how you might address it. The other study I have here is the Megan Gond New Horror study. And in this one, they w- kind of wanted to take a different approach. So they didn't want to focus solely on extinction because they were rightfully worried that this could produce extinction bursts for this participant. And they or even if it didn't, really just wanted a gentler responding. approach. Right? Like, yes. there's a lot. I know. Extinction is sometimes so sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I right? agree. So there can be other ways of doing things that are really less restrictive (laughs) can i tell you a funny side story everyone will appreciate this so i was at i worked in an office one time where i shared office space 
with other people. The DVD copy of Office Man? <laughs> yeah. I wasn't actually in there, but they were in there. And so in the morning, I always like to come in and say hi, you know, chat, chat, chat. So one of my coworkers did not love my chattiness in the morning. Was it and Diana? So, yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't Diana. Is this a story about me? This is when we were not working together. So this is like in my way back time. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, we were not working together this time. But every time I would come in, instead of just telling me that she wanted me not to talk to her in the morning, she tried to put my chattiness on extinction by just completely ignoring me. I'd be like, good morning. Mm. Nothing. Like, wouldn't even turn around. This is an adult doing this? Oh, yeah, 100% adult. It does not feel good. And then I was like, what did I do? I'm just trying to be friendly. And then... Then I would just be like, good morning, good morning, right? I did that. I sure. had an extinction birth. Mm-hmm. My variability of good mornings mm-hmm. got real annoying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I just stopped talking to her. And mm-hmm. now I actually don't even want to be friends with her. Yeah. Him. Right. Well, no, it's been a while. So yeah. it's fine. But like initially, right? So I experienced extinction. Right. So <laughs> there's extinction burst and emotional mm-hmm. responding mm-hmm. as well. And that person doesn't always have to be presented on the outward side too like you harbor resentment toward her yeah a little honestly, bit honestly because of that and that changes your oh, relationship oh mystery with her. person if you're listening you're a blast i know sorry but that's so funny right <laughs> so one thing that is kind of cool that i don't think existed then but exists now or have you guys seen those little octopuses that are like they're reversible. Our children own them, I so one. Rob, you don't need to make that face. I, I, I don't know what, what this the is. The happy octopus and I'm the I'm going to tell you octopus. about it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we so have one too. He, you can flip him inside out and one oh, side. They like a popple. In, he's kind of like a popple. He is kind of like a popple. <laughs> I love popples. Way to take it to the way back. 80s kids to 1983. Know. So they come in a variety of colors and one side has a happy face and the other side has a sad face on it or some variation. You can get them to be angry as well. We have an angry one. Yeah. We have angry and happy. Yeah. So you can use them if you want to signal that you don't want to talk, right? Or if you're in a bad mood or something like that without having to actually say anything. So an office area would be perfect. She could flip it to the sad side or the right. angry side and you'd be like, oh, right. not time to talk, to to talk right oh. now. I've also seen people use them like for their teens, like the teen can flip it whichever way. Yeah. And then you know, like, oh, it's not a good time to try to approach my teen to ask them to do this or that. I will wait until it's on the happy side. Sounds like somebody yeah. needs to listen to our podcast on the book, Crucial Conversations. <laughs> Who, me? No. 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 Who, I, using I avoid it I, to the I, I'm day not, I die. I'm not, ref- I'm not refuting the idea of using visual cues as a communication means. However, it is a bit basic in terms of how to communicate a need and over one's lifespan being able to talk about these things is probably the more important skill so if you're a child using this i see no problem with this i don't either and i would it's think always on the sad because if you gotta like go and be like hey buddy want to have a conversation all right i'm telling everyone out there if you ever try to use an octopus you're an adult and you try to use an octopus to communicate with me i'm having a crucial conversation with I you i don't think you're being very fair i think that it at times can be a perfectly useful and appropriate way to communicate that you don't want to talk. Disagree. No, it, it's it's fine. I would just wonder why an individual... It, I think it's one thing if it's sort of I'm in the middle of something. If it's more I don't like... Like Jackie's example, that sort of that person I would say probably should have had a conversation with Jackie of how I don't want to make you upset or think I don't like you. I do really like... you actually not just like me though too. Okay, well then she could have said I do want you to know how little I like you and I don't want you to come into my space anymore. But then you should have to look for safety which would be you can't have that conversation without making someone mad. So in any case, I think there are better ways to communicate one's needs than using visual supports if you are an adult working with other people. I like it. I would have appreciated it. If she just always put the octopus out. Yeah, but would she have done it as a sort of like, hey, everybody, just so you know, I've got this octopus. Or would it have been this passive aggressive, check the octopus on the door, Jackie. It's angry and hates you. (laughs) Well, either or, right? At least then I wouldn't have had to experience emotional responding. But You still may have. Anyway, I, I, I made us digress. We can we can move back. Yeah, let's talk let's talk about the magical land of Nathan. Okay. In this study, there's only one participant. He was named Nathan. He was 11. He did have a autism spectrum disorder, but they also noted he communicated fully verbally in full sentences, etc. And while he had had the diagnosis for several years, it was only in the last three months that he had started engaging in this type of language that sort of 
brought in people to intervene on this account. And he would talk about an imaginary land that he wanted to go to. And it's called the Magical Land of Nathan. And adults were not allowed to go there. I feel like this just seems like the kid needs a break. Mm. (laughs) Right? In a lot of ways. Like, can we get him a vacation? But it was kind of longstanding and, and did seem to meet this definition of of perseverative in that they had tried some other previously effective strategies according to the literature on this topic and they were not effective for him. The three previous studies done on this topic. Yeah. And his mom reported that if she tried to ignore this behavior, it often produced really high intensity and dangerous responses, including throwing things, environmental destruction, etc. So it, it was something that couldn't really be ignored, I guess, at this point. And they wanted to figure out an effective but gentle way of working with him on the magical land of Nathan. I think just because they chose the pseudonym Nathan, it makes me think of that Nathan for you show, Rob. (laughs) I'm glad you said Rob because I don't know that show. I know. (laughs) And then what was the uh, the name of that other show that guy did? The Rehearsal. Yes, which a lot of people have said can be viewed as a perspective of a neurodivergent person in a neurotypical world as well. I haven't seen the whole show, but I did Mm. watch a few episodes. It's interesting. It's an interesting show. Yeah, so people might, might... Check that. Anyway, but I don't think they chose the name Nathan for that reason. It's just a coincidence. And they did go ahead and do that for Condition Classic Iwata FA. And they found that attention, it was highest in attention. It was also kind of high in free play. You know, an adult is there in free play, which may function as an SD for interaction. So that might be why they saw it higher in those conditions as well. And then the intervention that they did was non-contingent reinforcement plus extinction. However... It was with a schedule fading condition. So let me describe what that looked like. They took the mean IRT between perceptive speech occurrences in the FA and based the interval for their NCR condition on that. So it was initially two minutes. So what they did was they started with a fixed time two minute delivery of attention. And the delivery was not like five seconds, like hey, buddy, I like your shirt, right? Which is super artificial, but rather it was 90 seconds of let's talk together about the magical land of Nathan, right? So it was intended to be really, you know, functionally tuned in to what they thought was going on here. And that was signaled to him by saying, okay, Nathan, tell me all about the magical land of Nathan for 90 seconds. And then when the time was up, they would say, okay, we're done talking about that for now. And then just for the remaining 30 seconds of that interval, they ignored. Okay? So there was an extinction component, but they had just spent 90 seconds talking about it. And once the he'd had five seconds with 20% or less of the perceptive speech only in the extinction window, they increased the interval length. So they moved from fixed time two minutes to FT five minutes, then FT 10 minutes, and then a variable time 10 minute schedule. This was very effective for Nathan. He didn't have a visual signal, but they did use that verbal signal, right? And they thought that there probably came to be some rule following components related to that. Initially, that wouldn't probably have worked because they tried a lot of other things and just saying it's not time to talk about that didn't work. But after they'd gone through this process, it did. They hypothesized that probably because they were engaging in that really high quality interaction on his preferred topic. That lowered the overall EO to engage in it outside of those contexts. Absolutely, and, yeah. And maybe that was never present before, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. so, you, there's no, you know, like, you'd be like, oh, he's talking about the magical world yeah. of Nathan. Yeah. And not, like, it really invested, yeah, right, in exactly. the magical world of Nathan. I mean, yeah. I was a little surprised in that, well, if DRA and extinction hadn't worked, that NCR and extinction would necessarily work better. Because I would think DRA, they're probably doing a lot of other things, and they'd still be giving him periods of time to talk about the magical end of Nathan, unless that wasn't the reinforcer. But it was also high in the free play condition, so Mm. it also might be reinforcing to talk about the magical end of Nathan, Mm -hmm. right? So I think it's I would think so. I would definitely think so. So just giving reinforcement on an alternative behavior wouldn't satiate that Mm. function of the behavior, right? So if you really want to talk about something... Just you, someone providing you reinforcement for talking about something else when you, all you really want to do is talk about Batman mm-hmm. or Girls Next Level. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Let's bring it yeah. back. Right? Like, 
you, you I, w- I would have loved to see the DRA extent. Like, I would have loved to see, like, this what is what it did. was. This is how yeah. it looked. This is why it was different. This was the schedule of reinforcement mm-hmm. that we're using. I think right. that would be a little bit more... It would, it would allow us to make those comparisons of, like, was there something that wasn't done in the DRA yeah, in extinction maybe. in terms of the amount or quantity or magnitude the or quality, sure. quality, may have quality of quantity reinforcement? May have Could right. we yeah. have matched them and it would have had the same results? Or was there something specific about the NCR? Which, again, is kind of a moot point in that it, they, they reached the goal right. and it, it, they weren't using, you know, harmful procedures. Right. So, Yeah, that would have been nice. This is it's also interesting study in that they got retroactive IRB approval. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So they did all this just, you know, clinically and then said, wow, this, you know, works so well for this guy. Let's that write this up. And they were able to do that. They they had IOA because the RBT was present and mm-hmm. took data oh, at the same time. Because the mom did some of it, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Oh, yes. I didn't say that. Yeah, some that's of the, also good, too. It was parent implemented in part. So they noted mm-hmm. that in the graph. And those, those data aligned perfectly with the researcher's data as well. Okay. So that... Brings us up to the present day. Yeah, and honestly, that was where this episode was going to end. But I think we all had a lot of thoughts about the idea of perseveration as a behavior in need of treatment and didn't really just want to wrap up with... In that we had reservations. We had reservations, yes. And we didn't want to sort of wrap up with our, like, going to the dissemination station and being like, do we really need any of this? This is ridiculous. Like, why aren't we more accepting of other people's interests in perseverative speech? And this is a little overblown. And we said, well, what if we looked at... An article that maybe focuses on how to use an individual's interest in developing some of the friendship skills that everyone was so worried about if perseverative speech is untreated. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to wrap up with a discussion of Hood and teaching the friendships, the beginning of friendship skills. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking about perseveration. But before we do that, I want to remind all our listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE and Quaba approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning CE. All you need to do is finish listening, then go to our website, ABA Inside Track, and click on the Get CEUs button for this episode. Or you can check your podcast player's notes page. We have a direct link there as well. And enter in some key information, including two secret code words. So here's the first one coming at you. It's Sherlock. S H E R. L-O-C-K, the famous detective. Perhaps he was discussed by one of our participants as a famous literary character. He solved mysteries. He had a TV show in England played by Benedict Cumberbatch. You're hilarious. Sherlock. All right, so now, so that we don't just end on do we need treatment for perseveration, let's talk about the flip side of what are some cool and recent social interaction treatment packages that are out there right now. So I was tasked to read this article and it is a little bit of a long one. It's around 30 ish pages. Mm -hmm. So if you are detailed, it's very detailed. If you are like, Oh, I'm just going to skim this one. You might need a little more time to skim it. Just putting it out there. There's a lot of figures. Yeah. There's a lot of figures and tables, but can I say that when I was reading this article, Everything that I wanted came to me. It was like hotel room service. It was amazing. (laughs) And I was thinking that these authors have listened to the call of behavior analysis. They included demographic information, Mm -hmm. which 
you know, we have been talking that we don't have for everyone, for participants, for trainers, for conversation partners. Every single person has some demographic information in here, which is spot on. They included social validity for both the parents, the trainers, the participants. They have been listening. They were very clear on their procedures except for one spot. And so, like, I was reading this and I was like hitting it home. And this mm-hmm. was a master's thesis. Felt yeah. like a doctoral thesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was... They did, did have many authors on it. Yes. From mm-hmm. many different locations. Right. Too. So a lot of people a lot added of to people this. Did this. this was like just the, uh, I assume, just the mm-hmm. grad like student. A yeah. blind effort and well done. Yes. Mm-hmm. Putting it out there, well done. And I, and I think it asked a question that I had never seen before in the social skills training literature, which was not what are the skills needed to engage in social interaction, but how do these social skills actually lead to the meaningful development of friendships? Which is sort of one of those questions that we're like, well, we assume if you can do the things that people who report they have friends can do, you'll also have friends. And never really asking, is that exactly what happens? Or maybe asking in sort of indirect ways or looking at things like maintenance of specific skills being used in the environment Mm -hmm. rather than... And how did that make you feel? And like, tell me about some of your friends and tell me about some of the things you and your friends do, which is not necessarily part of a direct experiment in many cases, but was kind of the crux of this experiment. Yeah. And so their, I guess their gung ho was what we talked about earlier, right? That it's really hard to make friends and keep friends. Previous research has taught a lot of skills in regard to making friendships, right? And But you need more than that good first impression to keep that friendship. So they said, okay, in previous literature, they use BST to teach these skills. Maybe we can use BST to teach these skills. And then we can use BST to teach the more fine grain units of how to stay involved in a conversation, Mm -hmm. both with what you want to talk about and what someone else wants to talk about. So that was really important. And so they said, it's important to find others that share the same interests as you. Right. So if you are engaged in a special interest, if you love Girls Next Lover, right, like I do, you have to find someone, which I haven't found yet. <laughs> so if anyone <laughs> listens, that's so you can you can talk to them about it. You can recall those interests and you can share those interests with others. So it's really going to be important here to establish audience control. And that's like good stimulus control. They have a really good example on page one zero three two. I'm going to pull it up. And read it. I was like to one you. zero. That's a weird way to say ten. Oh no! <laughs> I know one zero. We're in the era of giant Java. <laughs> okay, so it is. For example, someone may speak to four different individuals: Karen, Mike, Tara, and Chris, each with unique reinforcement histories. These differences result in conversing about dancing and music with Karen, cosplay with Mike, gaming with Tara, and sports with Chris. Adjusting one's conversation topics based on the presence of these audience may be critical in establishing meaningful relationships, right? So you can't talk about cosplay with Karen. Well, you can, but she probably wants to talk about dancing more. That's on page 1032, 1032. I just like that when they're talking about audience control and good stimulus control that you know who you're talking to, what they're interested in, and then how you can talk about what they're interested in, and then they're more likely to talk about what you're interested in, too. Yeah. Right? So... They also noted that listeners will provide higher quality reinforcement when you both are interested in the same thing. Mm. We have all been there, right? Rob talks talks about Batman with me. I'm like, yep. Mm. All the time. But if he's like, have you done this? I'm like, yeah. (laughs) But I only want to talk about Batman, the animated series, the 90s version of the Batman cartoon. I don't want to talk about other Batman. Yeah. Very narrow. Other so, Batman. No, Other I don't Batman. like those Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so the purpose of this study, uh, the purpose of the present study, wanted to establish audience control of shared interest topics through using differential qualities of reinforcement. So they had two parts. The first part they used BST to teach the following skills or to follow conversation partner initiated conversation through differential qual- qualities of reinforcement, and then to be able to shift. To if you see that someone is not interested in what you're talking about. Right. Right. And then to how to end the conversation, mm-hmm. which is important. And part two was teaching to end a conversation appropriately during repeated instances of in, uninterest and to discriminate who and what, who has shared interest with you and what those shared interests are. So they said that 
in part one, when they asked people, they asked their participants, okay, now of your conversation partners, who had the same shared interest with you? They couldn't answer that question. Mm -hmm. So that would be important, right? To like be maintaining those friendships. Yeah. as, As far as I know, the first time I had seen that question being a component. I mean, certainly they, they cite the peers curriculum, which we've talked about on the show in an mm-hmm. episode we did on, on social skills. And you know, sort of topics like that often come up, but they're usually in the context of engaging in a different social skill. Like, you know, you can join the conversation because you know what they're talking about. Right. And the more general, you should find people who like common interests. But it can, as you mentioned, you know, Jackie, just setting up social situations where everyone should be doing something that should be fun for all participants doesn't necessarily mean to the emission of those social skills or the right. development of friendships. Yeah. Okay. So they had three participants. All of them had a diagnosis of autism, spectrum disorder, and various other disabilities or disorders. They were 9 to 16 years old. They included demographic information for everyone, which is great. All of the participants had been reported to have conversation difficulties, and so they did these sessions at a university-based clinic, and I think all of the participants were in gen ed at some point and could read because the the prompting was a textual prompt. So that's important to put out there. They receive both consent and assent and debrief the participants. So I love that, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Prior to each session. And they had multiple adults that worked with the participants. They had a trainer that was only used for training (laughs) purposes. And then they had other adults for conversation partners. So Um, many Confederates. So many. So the (laughs) trainers, each session, each of them were students in the Masters of ABA program or undergraduate in psychology with the exception for the older participant, the 16-year-old participant, they used a peer with actual simul interests. So that's great, yeah. yep. right? And then they yes. had confederates that they used part of a social party. The party condition, yeah. The party <laughs> condition, right? But you would need that. It was, I, was, I thought that was great. Right? I thought that was a really cool addition to the study. As I'm sitting there, I'm like, I could use that. <laughs> like, we should have also used, right? There's no parties for eight and nine-year-olds usually that you have to, like, converse. Yeah. But as an adult, like, I would have loved that condition to practice. To practice talking oh. and leaving conversations. Nothing worse. That's Diana's worst nightmare. It is my worst nightmare. And the so small talk, small talk party. Yeah. <laughs> so each participant had at least one male conversation partner, but the rest were female. So they did also note that out. So the only thing that the conver- conversation partners were trained on is to provide that differential attention. They used BST to do that. They did not train them in providing prompts or feedback for the participants because that was not their job. Yep. Their job was just to engage in a conversation yeah so i like that that they didn't have any other like oh you did good here but right like that's yeah. not how life is they either were having a conversation or, or seeming bored about the conversation they were having yes that's it yeah i liked that and that's pretty similar we did uh, man and karsten had a study we did on a grab bag 122 that did something a little bit similar in terms of working with i think it was college age students right and getting feedback but, but again that was more on focusing just on the single skill of identifying signs that your conversation partner is no longer interested in the topic you are discussing. Yeah. So I thought that was really great is that they had a trainer to provide all that feedback, but then they had these conversation partners. And I think one of the most important things to know is that these conversations were not scripted, Mm -hmm. Yeah. right? They're just regular conversations. We're having conversations. It's not like I'm like, today we're going to talk about, because that's not how life works. They knew the bank of topics. That was it though. Yeah. Okay. So they recorded the participant in conversation responses via video, except if changes needed to be made, and then they had someone in person. They have great tables and figures in here, and they have a flow chart. When I saw it, I was like, Diana is into this flow chart. (laughs) But I actually needed the flow chart because it is fairly complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated and simple. That's the weird part. Well, I right? feel like you can both explain this study in about two pages or very quickly, like have an elevator pitch, but you could also take the 30 pages that it took needed, as well. I think they needed to take the 30 pages if someone's going to try to replicate this. But anyway, so on table one, they had the description of the what they called the discriminative stimulation, uh, stimulation, the discriminative situation. And that is the conversation. That's what they call it. Previously, they called it something else. Each of these were about 20 minutes in length, and they scored as correct, incorrect, correct, prompted, incorrect, prompted, and etc. And then they used that as a total percentage. They looked at each discrimination situations correct over the total situations, and that's what they graphed. So 
They also took. They took a lot of data. Mm-hmm. Just really, really so did much data. They took data on the conversation partner initiated topic, and so that was defined as when the p- participant responded within five seconds. They and they have like, okay, here's what an incorrect response looks mm-hmm. like. Here, they took a they took response of shifting the topic or ending the conversation when the participant engaged in the target skill. They took a correct response for shifting the conversation was scored for the participant initiated any new topic of conversation. They really were like going for it. Then they took data on whether it was prompted, whether they used the textual prompt, if there was errors of omission or commission during the conversation. They also took data on the duration of the speaking on share topics and all other topics using second by second data. Woo, with a two second off, that is like a nightmare. So obviously they were watching, rewinding. Oh yes, watching mm. second by second rewinding recording is amazing and hard. Mm-hmm. And they also computed a discrimination index where they looked at the number of correct over the total number of correct categorization. Being like, are you talking about the shared interest? Do you know that you're talk that you each have shared interests over mm. the total number right. of categorization? So that was kind of neat. I was surprised about that. The IOA. They did IOA. It was great. They did procedural integrity. It was great. They literally had everything in the study. So they used a multiple baseline across conversation skills in part one. And in part two, they had a non-concurrent multiple baseline design across participants. Paul also had a reversal design because he, they were looking at different things for him because they looked at the preference assessment of the conversation partner and that sort of thing. Not the same Paul that was in my other study though. No. New Paul. New Paul. New Paul. That's what we'll call him. So they attended the clinic one to two times per week for one or two hours, but each conversation or dis- discriminative stimulation dis- situation, wow, I cannot <laughs> say that today, was for around 20 minutes and the topics were not scripted. So You got it. I like that. In table one, they say, okay, following a conversation was this, making a two volley statement or questions related to the topic has to be three words in length. And then they give you all of the potential errors Yes. That they could have done, Mm -hmm. which is very, I love that they put it in this table. So some of the errors, making an unrelated statement, making a self-related comment, responding with less than three words, responding only with positive feedback, like, yeah, that's cool. That was really helpful for me because in the discussion, they said that that was one of the primary errors for one of the participants. And I was like, oh, yeah, you could do that, but then it doesn't really move you on Mm -hmm. in the conversation. Did you all identify, like, look at that table and you're like, oh, look at all the errors I make in conversation? Yes. <laughs> yep. That's one. I do that all the time. I provide positive feedback. Oh, cool. And then it's like, yeah, blank space, blank space. Someone said to me the other day, is the only things you say, yeah, and that's cool. <gasps> Who? Well, I'm not going to say on oh, the okay. show. That's true. I was like, well, it's because, like, I kind of have social anxiety and I do want to extract myself from this conversation as quickly as possible. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, so then, you know, that's they start off there, and then the conversation partner is going to engage in something that looks uninteresting, yeah. right? This is programmed, so they're not being mean. This is part of the thing, so then they will look at their phone, withdraw eye contact, and then they have to either change the topic to a new topic of conversation or change the topic conversation to a topic of interest, right? Yeah. Of their own interest to gauge mm-hmm. whether somebody wants to listen. Yeah. And then... After that, if the conversation partner engages, great, keep going. Then you go back up. But if they don't, then if they do two consecutive things of an interest, then you would try to shut down the conversation. Right? And that was hard Mm -hmm. for people. So that's what that table two does. Table three or table one does that. Table two shows you all of the participants, their conversation partner, their programs of shared interest, so things like cats, video games, exercise. Some of them had none. That's important. Right. Each mm-hmm. one had no shared interests. Harry Potter. And if they contacted the differential reinforcement and where. I liked that table a lot. Me too. Mm-hmm. I like I make this. one for all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You're like, have I provided them differential reinforcement <laughs> for our shared interests? <laughs> So that's what they did in table two, which I think was really helpful. And the flow chart was in figure one. And the flow chart just showed you, okay, what on the left-hand side was either the conversation 
partner or the participant, and then what happened in each in each area. And then it's like a little flow chart going all the way down, right? So you have your situation, the conversation partner initiates a conversation, and then whether the participant does no response, makes an error or a correct response, it like flows down to what they'll do, and it'll show you where the textual prompts were provided in gray. I love that. They made a little bit, everything else is white. Mm -hmm. And then either the conversation continues or it doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Then you keep showing disinterest and then it moves through. So I just really loved this flow chart. The end is always responded with a salutation. I love that. Good Eve. Good Eve, my <laughs> fair friend. <laughs> so till the morrow. What I would recommend is looking at that flowchart first and then reading it. I think it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what's also important, too, is that for the first 15 minutes of the conversation, the conversation partner altered between their initiated topic and the shared interest. And then after 15 minutes, the partner could look at disinterested so that you could end the conversation. And the conversation was ultimately ended at 20 minutes, regardless of who ended the conversation. That's a long conversation. It is a long conversation. And one thing I loved is that they just kind of pop this in here, but it's like pretty important, is that they did a pre-assessment to assess whether attention was reinforcing. They used the split room. Yeah. And it was. Yeah. So that's great, right? Because this won't work if the differential... Uh, you know, amount of attention for this higher quality talk is not reinforcing yeah. for them, right? It's not going to work. So the split room assessment, if people don't know. You love you, this one. I do. I really love it. And it's it's almost like a mythology. It's like hard to find studies that, that talk about it directly. But you put a piece of tape down the middle of the room. You put the same exact items on each side of the room. And then you put a person on one side of the room. And so when the child or anyway, the person crosses over to the side of the room with the person over the tape then that person will engage with them and talk with them if they're on the other side of the room then they just interact with the toys or whatever is over there and you measure how much time they spend on the side of the room with the person who's going to interact yeah they did this with paul too at the end so we don't have to talk about it to see if he preferred one conversation partner over another and turns out he did mm -hmm. so that is interesting as well mm -hmm, right okay so for that was just the general methods see it's a lot in part one I'm going to wrap this one up in part one. They use BST to teach conversation par partner initiated conversations, shifting the conversation and ending the conversation. They provide the rationale. They modeled. They showed examples and non-examples. One thing I love, the non-examples were taken directly from the pretest. So of what the participant did. Then they asked them about like what they saw. And then if they how they answered, we, they asked the provide rationale for why they got it wrong to make sure right which i love right because they're not just be like no you're wrong mm. so i liked that and then if the participant engaged in an incorrect response they held that textual prompt up so an example was make a statement or ask a question about this topic mm. so mastery criteria was three sessions at 80 percent or two consecutive at 90 percent and during part one they found out that the participants during their interverbal categorization test could not identify shared interest. So that is what they did in the second mm -hmm. part is they used BST to teach discrimination of shared interest with the same procedures as part one. The trainer though was one trainer and they just wore different shirts and were different characters, which I liked. And so they had a variety of different shared interests and pretend characters, like 10 different pretend characters that the trainer played with. But this wasn't effective for two of the participants, the younger participants. So they added in a rule. So they re reviewed the rules prior to the communication sessions. I don't know what the rules were, though. So I think that would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then for that wasn't effective. And so for post-teaching rule two, they gave the rules prior to each conversation. And that was really effective. And for one participant, Paul, they found that he always ended the conversation early for multiple of his conversations partners. And we're like, oh, it's not working, but engaged in really high quality conversation for one of the conversation partners. So that's why they did this preference assessment to see 
who he preferred, and he actually did prefer yeah. this. The issue was less about the, oh, I don't want to have the conversation because I, un- I don't share any interest so much as, I right. just don't want to talk to you. Right, and that's okay. I don't okay. care what we talk about. <laughs> right, yeah. and that's okay. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you really jive with someone, and sometimes yeah. you don't. Yeah, so I love that they There's ask- more to a conversation than just a shared interest sometimes. So. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, Interesting to know. I love that they asked social validity for everyone. Absolutely. Right? They talked about to the parents. They talked to the participants. They uh, talked to the people at the social party that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And so I liked that. And this really worked. Mm -hmm. Right? For figure two and three, they showed that the BST and textual prompts work. And the most common errors that they were making were off-topic statements and providing positive feedback. And I was like, yep. (laughs) That's totally me. Right? But it is important to note that the BST training data were not on this graph mm-hmm. because sometimes people look for it, right? And it's just not there. And that's yeah, okay. it's not always there. Yeah. yeah. In part two, they taught using BST and textual prompts how to identify shared interests. And so they really saw great social validity on the part of the parent and the child. And not only did the and the Confederates, they perform, they reported satisfaction with how the participant initiated and shifted the conversation during mm-hmm. those party times, mm-hmm. where in the in pre-teaching they did not. Mm-hmm. So I uh, love this study. Yeah. I love I want to do it. It seems like a lot of work, but I want to do it. So the authors suggest that we should probably go into dissemination station. I think actually. so. Yeah. That's yeah. not what they suggested. But well, we're, we're I suggesting think we that. should because I think these That's are next what they steps. Would so let's, yeah. yeah, so let's go into dissemination station and to sum up everything we've been talking about and then talk about this maybe as our, our kind of next steps for folks out there. Yeah. Here we are. So I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about this study. I'm glad this study exists because otherwise dissemination station would have really just been a lot of talk about like, well, do we really need treatment for perseveration outside of the world of nation potentially leading to some unsafe behaviors when on extinction? Probably not. But that doesn't really answer the question of, well, what happens when perseveration occurs exclusively? And while I think some of these treatments, you you may find that they are needed for some clients, really the focus should be on the are we finding ways to help our clients and help participants identify what they are interested in life and then find a community that will naturally reinforce their conversation topics in meaningful ways. And I think the Hood study really points out the idea that just being able to identify that people don't want to talk about what you want to talk about doesn't necessarily lead to individuals learning what they want to talk about or how to talk about what they are of interest in. And that is a real – it's kind of one of those one of those deficits of in previous research that I didn't even think about as deficits mm-hmm. until I read this article and realized, oh, yeah, we haven't asked that question. That sort of was a, an assumption that we we've – many of us have been making – so I think it was great to add this in there. It's really kind of a, a good next step as to some really meaningful updates to social skill programs and social skill training and social you know, skill instruction. I also think that it's important. I, I love the Hood study. I think this is the direction we should go in the future. I think very often what we're claiming as being problem behavior related to perseveration is not. And we need to switch our perspective and increase everyone's you know fluency regarding this topic and flexibility. I do think we should point out that all of, I think all of these articles identified attention as the main variable. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe tangible too. Right. But one could engage in this type of behavior for multiple reasons. And it's not always just because I, I love to talk about this topic and I'll tell tell anybody about it. Right. Which has kind of seemed to be the case here. So I think that's important to note as well. I've worked with several individuals for whom their perseverative speech seems to be about some type of like negative internal negative reinforcement, some type of like alleviation about their worries or concerns. Mm-hmm. And once they finally hear that from someone, they're OK for a little bit of time and then it will kind of start over again. And in those situations, it may be something entirely different than what this is that would ultimately help them. So I've had. I've seen success with using, you know, visual schedules and reminders and having someone practice writing things out and almost do like a journaling type of thing. And that was really beneficial. But that may be a whole different animal that also gets labeled as perseverative speech sometimes. I just want to make that note. I I, I think I I agree, Dan. I think I probably categorize that as more like signs of an internal 
anxious state struggle yeah rather than i think what we saw here like you said which was more sort of what we think about as sort of you know socially inappropriate conversations I, rob said that with head well, i made i made a face and you know shook he's my shaking head around. his head like he's <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah okay that was my two bits my two bits I really loved, in my article, they talked about the potential for future research to look and how we can incorporate this into bullying curriculum yeah. and how to look at who are your allies and who you can find to talk about things. Mm-hmm. I just really yeah. thought that was a great... Mm-hmm. Yeah, a but great... also, we should educate those bullies. Right. Yes, I agree, too. Yeah. Oh, and I know you do. I love also that they pointed out that participants should be included in these and mm-hmm. their goals should guide our discussion and creation of research so you know they obtained assent every time they got social validity and it was great for these participants i do wonder if this might be more beneficial for the older older student because we did see Mm -hmm. the 16 year old do better Mm -hmm. right yeah and i'm wondering you know the eight and nine year old yeah you do need conversation skills when you're eight or nine but i'm wondering if this application with the textual prompts and bst is better suited for older participants but again i don't know i think i mean i think um, a lot of the research is done for adolescents so like right. say logs and peers curriculum i want to say janine stickter sci i i'm 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 forgetting the acronym it also has a similar mm-hmm. type of sort of BST plus didactic instruction and explicit social skill instruction program. I, I know she does. I, I just can't remember if that's the name of it. I believe it was mostly with children that we consider sort of older children, so less elementary age children. But I may be wrong. Jeannie Stichter may have done some elementary work. It's been a while since I've looked at that, at that line of research. I how that would be different. Yeah. Right? I'm just wondering like what that would look like. But anyway. Yeah, it, it may be more yeah. focused on the interactions. Eight you know, younger children interact more than they do yeah. converse necessarily. Yeah, they don't particularly stay on topic. Yeah. Generally, or, the, or their topics are age. these are the things we're doing. Let's talk about what's in front of us, and we're yeah. doing this activity with Pokemon yeah. or with our Batman sleds. Yeah, and it's not unusual for a conversation to take a complete left turn, mm-hmm. but then everyone kind of takes the turn with the conversation. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a different thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. I love it. So I, I I think this was a great topic in the sense that we all came about in terms of you know increasing our own knowledge of the area and then really kind of reflecting on what makes a good treatment just the potential for well maybe you won't have a friend as an adult if you engage in perseveration is not necessarily cause for and now i must teach you how to not engage in this behavior because that is very much trying to normalize an individual in a way that could be harmful so there uh, you know but this i think lets us say and end with a well, what if we did this instead? And it includes the participant interests. So we're not just focusing on what parents or other members of society or us as therapists or clinicians think is most important. So I'm glad we came to this conclusion. Mm-hmm. Well, I, mean, I think we had this conclusion, but I'm glad we came to this in the context of talking about perseveration because I know there was a period where this would have been a much more negative ending and made us all sad. So I think we're all feeling pretty, pretty positive about where this line of research has eventually led us to. Yeah, I love it. Me too. Uh, all right. Well, listeners, we hope you also found this to be an interesting and fun topic and said, you know what? Whether I am or I'm not, I'm going to resubscribe or double subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher to hear even more ABA Inside Track in the future. Thank you so much for doing so and for listening. There are a lot of other places you can find us online, too. You can go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, where you can find links to all of our previous episodes, links to the articles that we discussed in this episode, and to purchase CEs. You can watch these on our YouTube page with the YouTube subtitle feature enabled. You can find us on all the social medias as ABA Inside Track, and you can get even more ABA Inside Inside Track content on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where for $5 a month, you can get episodes a week ahead of time and vote in our live episodes that we do over Zoom and people can join in and also vote on our book club podcast. But if you want to hear those extra long book club podcasts, we just had one on Between Now and Dreams, you'll need to subscribe at our $10 premium level where you get that two CEs for free for just listening to the book club episodes, as well as discounts at our CE store. And again, that's patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. But for those of you who just love listening to the show and say, I occasionally want to get some CEs from my friends at ABA Inside Track, don't worry. I know you're saying it. Where's my second secret code word? I didn't forget and then have to put it in later in post-production. I remembered (laughs) to put it in the main recording and it is taboo. 
T-A-B-O-O. Now, it's not the taboo you're thinking of. It's actually the board game, Taboo, which we noticed was in a corner, and then Diana and I had a long debate about why we didn't ever played Taboo, and perhaps we'll go do that now that we're done recording. Well, that didn't make the cut into the recording? What, you didn't make, what didn't Just make kidding. the cut? Oh, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> Our editor may have taken it out already. So the code word, Taboo. And speaking of people who help us make the show, we also want to make some big thanks to... Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, Kyle Sturry for our interstitial music, and Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode, but until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye. Bye.